Hi folks, I'm Linda Shenton Matchett and I am a Christian author of historical fiction and I am a huge history geek. And so because of that, I am enjoying sharing these short videos with you about factoids that I have dug up, artifacts I have found, um, and other information that I'd love to pass on just because I think there may be other history geeks out there. So hopefully there are. Um, so history is more than just dates and locations. History is about people uh, and events, and but mostly about the people. So what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to get to in just a second, but I wanted to let you know that at 7 o'clock, which is 15 minutes from now, I'm going to be part of the Faith, Hope, and Love Facebook party. So you can either uh, hop on over to your search page at the top left-hand corner of your Facebook page and type in Faith, Faith Hope, Love chapter or go to my uh, Facebook page, my author page, Linda Shenton Matchett, and there should be a meme and some information there as well so that you can find it. So uh, we'll be doing that at 7 o'clock. I will be there around 7.30ish uh, for my half hour uh, because Ann Green is not going to be able to join us, but uh, I will be there for the entire party. So hopefully you can hang around and enjoy me for that. Now, um, so let's get started. Now, I do have a special guest um, that will be joining us later. Um, if he wanders off, uh, it may be a little dicey, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, he will be here at the end of the video. So without further ado, who wants to talk a little history? Okay, let's see. Now, uh, so do you own a dog? Type yes in the comments if you do. And uh, no, of course, if you do not. Uh, or if you have had a dog in your past. Um, and also share with us the breed that you have. Uh, over the course of my married life, we have had um, quite a few dogs. Our very first dog that we got when we bought our first house was a Dalmatian. My husband always wanted one of those, and uh, literally a week after we purchased our home, he said, okay, we have our own home, we're no longer an apartment, let's get a dog. So we were living in the Washington, D.C. area, and there were quite a few breeders, and we were able to find one down in Charlottesville, and were able to secure a, a Dalmatian, and he was absolutely fabulous. Uh, he was exhausting. He was a puppy for probably five, six, seven years, something like that. He was very, very active. Um, he wore us out. So we decided he needed a friend and we went to the local shelter and um, he was too funny. We went and we found a German Shepherd mix who was absolutely wonderful, very soft-hearted dog named Charlie and they played together in the yard uh, outside of the Humane Society shelter uh, and Ringo was very excited about that. Ringo was our Dalmatian. He was very excited about that until we put Charlie in the car and then he started to pout. Um, they did eventually get along and they got along very well and then a short time later we added a third dog to the mix and we got a Boston Terrier named Buster that I found at a craft fair. Go figure. Uh, so um, over the years we have lost dogs, gained dogs. Um, I currently have a Boston Terrier. He's 15 years old. His name is Ben and I got him at our local shelter um, the Lakes Region Humane Society uh, up in Meredith. And so he is just a wonderful little animal um, and, and the love of our life. Um, so, um, oh, a story about Buster before I forget. Um, like I said, we had a Dalmatian and a German Shepherd, and then we got this Boston Terrier. Well, our next door neighbors uh, had a golden retriever that apparently had some sort of thyroid problem. And he weighed probably 125 pounds plus. I don't know. Some days he looked like he weighed 150, but that may have been all that hair. Um, we had a swing set in our backyard, and we let the neighbor's grandkids come over and play on the swing set whenever they wanted. And one day, the kids were out there. And our Dalmatian, being as friendly as he was, was very excited that they were there. And so he, he raced out of the house and ran over the swing set and wanted to play with the kids. Well, Jake, who was the um, golden retriever, thought that Ringo was going to attack his grandkids. So he started to attack our Dalmatian, and they got into quite a tussle. Well, here comes Buster, my Boston Terrier, and he absolutely lit into this 
golden retriever, and nipping at his heels back and forth, front, back, front, back, front, back. And meanwhile, our German shepherd stood on the porch barking like, yo, mom, got a problem out here. Hopefully somebody's going to do something about this. Um, fed up with everything, the, uh, the golden retriever finally ran off. So my little 22-pound, uh, something like that, Boston Terrier ran off the German Shepherd and, and had quite a few words to say to him as he was running over the horizon. So Bostons are a tenacious little breed, and when they feel their family's being threatened, they certainly take care of it. Uh, and I think as you can tell by how I'm talking about these animals, just how much uh, my husband and I love them and they are part of our family. Um, so what does this have to do with World War II? Um, shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were a group of dog fanciers, um, mostly from the American Kennel Society, that decided that we could use, we the country could use, uh, man's best friend as part of the war effort to help us win the war. And so they approached the army and said, we know you've got a handful, which was the case. They had maybe 50 dogs um, in the Alaskan region, mostly as sled dogs. And they decided that that was going to be a really great way um, to help the war effort was to provide dogs. So a lot of conversations probably committed to death, but ultimately it was decided that it was indeed a great idea and that because there was concern about uh, invasion as well as uh, submarine landings that would be resulting in sabotage, uh, the Army decided that, yes, we did indeed need sentry dogs to patrol the coast, both coasts. We had the uh, West Coast and the East Coast, of course. Uh, and so they decided that was a great idea. So Dogs for Defense was born. And so the AKC made lots of announcements, radio programs, interviews, lots of different ways, posters, of course. And so they got the word out that they needed dogs to be donated. And there was a rousing success. Um, hundreds of thousands of people raised their hand um, and said, we would like to donate our dog. And so ultimately, uh, the Army decided to start with just a couple of hundred. And they did have some parameters um, with age, size, breeds, that sort of thing. But they did end up using quite a few different breeds. And um, so they set up a training center and they had these couple of hundred dogs and uh, they did quite a bit of training, but it was not very successful. And the reason for that was uh, twofold. Uh, the inconsistency of the training, because there were four or five different centers throughout the United States, it was inconsistent with the training. And so the dogs did not get the same exact training from one center to the other. The other part that I think is amusing that was uh, discussed at length in a report that was issued by the Army was the fact that the handlers also needed training. And so apparently they were very inconsistent with the dogs and with their handling of the animals. So uh, when it came to performance time, the dogs were not very effective. So um, they decided that they needed to, to get down to brass tacks. And one of the co-founders named Arlene Erlanger, she was, as I said, all uh, from the American Kennel Society. She wrote a manual. Uh, it was several pages, probably several dozen pages. And she wrote a manual that was to be adhered to very specifically and very consistently at each of the training centers. So once that happened, the training became uh, quite a bit better. And so uh, all told, they ended up with, within the first six or eight months, about 1,800 dogs that were patrolling the East and the West Coast. So very, very successful. Um, initially, the program took... Um, took hi Valerie how are you good to see you come in um sorry that distracted me apparently I'm like something shiny uh anyway the program took any breed at any age but they did quickly find out that that was not a good idea so uh for example hound dogs apparently got very distracted by all of the scents that they could pick up so by 1943-ish 
Um, there were seven breeds. Let me see if I get this right. German Shepherd, Doberman Pinscher, Belgian Sheepdog, Collie, Siberian Husky, Malamute, and Eskimo Dog. I think it's fascinating that uh, three of the seven dog breeds are located up in the Arctic regions with the Husky, Malamute, and Eskimo Dog. So very interesting. Um, also in the beginning of the program, dogs ages one through five were being used. Uh, but they soon found out that indeed they could not teach an old dog new tricks. Um, they found that the older animals were just not taking to the new owners and uh, the training in any way, shape, or form. So they lowered the maximum age to three and a half, and they tried that for a while, but then that didn't work very, very well either, so they then dropped the, uh, the maximum age to two years old. So they basically took animals uh, that were about eight months old all the way up to two years old. I guess uh, anything less than eight months old, they were still too puppyish and did not adhere to the training as they would have liked them to. So um, I thought it was interesting the seven breeds that they selected. Um, now I don't know a lot about um, additional breeds other than what we had, the German Shepherd, the Boston Terrier, and the uh, Dalmatian. But my Dalmatian was an incredible working dog. In fact, if you don't know the history of the Dalmatians, they were indeed used with the fire departments. It is not just a myth or a tradition. Uh, back when fire engines were wagon led uh, by horses, um, the Dalmatians were used to keep the horses standing in the place they needed to be standing uh, so that the firemen could use the water and the supplies that were on the wagon. So Dalmatians are very bright animals. And so I was kind of surprised that they did not use the Dalmatian. And again, there are quite a few other, uh, what I would call uh, sporting dogs. I don't know if that's the official uh, classification or not, but quite a few other dogs that I think could have been helpful. But again, they may not have found that work very well at all. Um, so once the country realized as the war went on, and it was in the late 1943, early 1944 time frame, and they realized that the opportunities for submarine landing sabotage was fairly minimal, uh, they decided they wanted to expand the use of dogs. Uh, and so they decided to actually train them to be used as messenger dogs, um, as well as mine uh, finding dogs, detecting, I guess is the right word, mind detecting dogs. Um, and so they uh, amplified the training and they sent them overseas, uh, starting out in the Pacific. And that met with limited success. Uh, and the reason being that they had not counted on the artillery fire uh, absolutely terrifying the animals. Now, why they didn't think of that is certainly beyond me. I think it would be absolutely terrifying to a human. And so you get an animal who doesn't understand um, the, the cannons and the tanks and just all of the loud noises. Um, but again, I wasn't there. So, um, so the dogs were only successful in a non-combat situation. So as long as um, there was not a battle going on, they were used very successfully uh, as a messenger, and what they did was they would tie a message to the, uh, a coded message to the dog's collar and send them down the line uh, upwards to 600 or 1,000 yards, and the dogs would be able to find who they were looking for and, uh, and deliver the message and then bring one back. Additionally, um, one thing that they were not, had not been trained in and were not, didn't realize that it could exactly happen, um, was that the dogs were able to find and uh, scout out enemy soldiers. So not exactly sure how, but there were several incidents that were mentioned where the dogs uh, ferreted out uh, Japanese soldiers and uh, so that prevented an ambush. So the dogs were used uh, for quite a lot. And uh, another thing in the report that I read was that um, the, the dogs were more successful in the Pacific theater versus the European theater. And um, it, was, it was very interesting. It was the open 
I, they were talking about the, the fact that kind of in the Pacific, it was undercover and jungle and, and the dogs apparently were much more comfortable than with the open wide spaces of Europe. So um, all told, they ended up using about 15,000 dogs, which I think is, is pretty amazing. Um, and, and the fact that that many people raised their hand to donate their dog. Um, I have no kids, and so my dogs are my kids. And I don't know, honestly, if I would have have had the heart to do that. Um, could I have done that if I thought that the only the only thing standing between me and the downfall of my country was if I donated my dog um, to be in this program? Maybe I would have. Uh, you know, I think you don't really know what you would do until you were up against it. And so um, I just admire these folks who were uh, willing to do that. And uh, the last thing about this, the, the reports that I read, um, there were about 3,000 dogs that they had to place after the war because either their owners had passed away or were not interested in getting the dog back. And so they were able to place these dogs and only four out of 3,000 of these dogs that needed to be placed with new owners came back as unplaceable. Um, the dogs were trained um, to, I guess, demob them from the military and help them to be re-socialized into a non-combat situation. So a fascinating program um, to realize what all they did during the war uh, and got creative as far as as what they could do to help stop the uh, the invasions and the, the battles. So now, why don't you type yes in the con comments if you think you would be willing to donate your dog? Um, and maybe a question mark if you're not sure. But I, I know that would be a really hard decision. So before I go, like I said, I promised you a special guest. So here you go. Okay, so this is my dog, Ben, and as you can see, he's, he's a little old man, he's got cataracts, and he's very hard of hearing, but this is my little man, um, and he is spoiled rotten, and I did ask him um, if he would have volunteered, and he told me that it would all depend on the snacks that they provided, because he is very into snacks. So, that is my special guest for tonight. Now, like I said, I hope that you have time to hang around uh, and go to the Facebook party that I'll be part of. Starts at 7 o'clock. There'll be five authors there. And it is with the Faith, Hope, and Love chapter of Romance Writers of America. So if you search for Faith, Hope, Love chapter, you should be able to find the party. And I hope that you will join me next week at the same time, 645 on Thursdays. Thank you for stopping by. Blessings on your week.